Bonjour. I hope you don't mind me speaking in English. Trust me, it'll be better than French. <laughs> hmm. So culture, culture hacking, that's what we'll talk about. Culture is everywhere. There's a culture to this conference right here, right now. Everything that you expect, all the behaviors, all the values, all the desires you have for this are all contributing to the culture of this room. And this culture is gonna change. It's gonna change within this speech. It will change by the end of the day. Where I first started learning about culture was here. Does anybody recognize this? Anybody? A few of you. It's called Burning Man. It's a festival in the desert of 50,000 people, all gathering together for a week to live life as art, to create culture for one week together. And you'll see every kind of person there, every walk of life. Everywhere you go, there are things like this. People create this just for the week. You see art, you see presentations, theater, music. Even the vehicles that go around are all art and created for this experience. Even walking around, people are walking as art and expression. Here's a roller skating in the middle of the desert just to create that as an experience. And here's, a, in the outstretches of it, a cafe. <laughs> and here's me at that cafe, <laughs> drinking coffee. And as I was at this event, just having the time of my life with friends, enjoying myself, going out, seeing so many people, I thought to myself, what makes this culture work? How can this work? 50,000 people together coming together to create this experience. How is there not chaos? How are people not fighting to put these people, all strangers, together for a week? And then I saw this. These are the 10 principles. The 10 principles of Burning Man that everyone agrees to when they come to participate in this event. The first, radical inclusion. And you can't see it, but there are questions for each. What if we all practiced radical inclusion involving everyone? What if we all held gifting as the highest way to share? Radical self-reliance. They only provide the toilets. So everything else you have to bring and provide for yourself. Radical self-expression, living life as art, communal effort, leaving no trace. 60,000 people leave and there's nothing left to leave the land exactly how it was. So these are the principles, these are the values that are guiding this community to come together. And what struck me as very important for me is the second one, gifting. Because not everybody can create a big building, but everyone gives a gift because there's no money exchanged. And that gift can be anything from food, to a massage, to uh, a necklace, jewelry, art. And what I thought of came from the work of Eckhart Tolle, the power of now, the power of being present, and how powerful that force is to be completely here in the moment. And I wanted to create something for that, so I came up with this idea I came up with an invention. A watch that just says now. It can't tell time. I call it the most accurate, precise watch in the world. It always tells the right time. Doesn't even need a battery. 
So I created this to share with the Burning Man community, and people loved it. They loved it. Everyone went crazy for it. They thought it was great. So I thought this would be great to create a business out of it. <laughs> Why not start selling these, these now pieces for people who also wanted to live in the now? Every, even when I got home, people were excited about it. So I invested a lot of my money, all of my money, my friends' money, my family's money to start this business. I even took, they took years, but I got the trademark for it and was working so hard to put this together. And then one day, I come home, and I get an envelope in my hands, and I have this sinking feeling. I just, oh, I just, I just knew it, what it was. It was this here, which is a letter, a cease and desist, essentially saying, terminate the business. And I spoke to my lawyers because I had a trademark. And I said, what, I can do this. And they said, okay, we'll try it. And I spent more money and more money fighting it until they said that it would take three more years to win and I might not win. And hundreds of thousands of dollars just to find out if I'm right. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm out. I'm done. You win. And what I was left with was lots of bills of debt just up to here in debt. I sold everything I had. I sold my car. I had to move in with my parents. It was just felt awful, and I didn't know what to do. I had no idea. I can't. I, who do I talk to? I can't pay anyone to help me out of this. I can't even go bankrupt because I owe this money to my friends, to my family. I, I have to somehow get back, and I didn't know what to do until I discovered something. I discovered there was a community for this. I'd found this great community in Burning Man and then into this world of business, and I didn't realize there was a whole community of people who were suffering the way I did who could help. And the name of that group is Debtors Anonymous. <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's very real. It's based on Alcoholics Anonymous of people who our debtors. And I went to this group and I thought, I'm just going to go in here, figure out how to get money and get out. And it was amazing the people I found in there. Entrepreneurs who had risked it all, lost it all, got it back, lost it again, and just created this habit of debting. And it would ruin their lives, ruin their families' lives. And this group came together to support each other. And I started going to the meetings three times a week. I got a sponsor. I, my, my sponsor had gone deep into debt and got himself out and was making hundreds of thousands a year, I said, I have to learn what, what, what you're doing and how you did this. And I came to really, really respect this community. And I came, I worked the steps. I, I really put all this effort into it to bring my life back. And it really worked. And in just a couple of years, I was back on my feet, out of debt, great car, job, even a house. And I, I really had this community to thank. And I thought, okay, what makes this culture work? This is a whole culture in and of itself. I had only known Alcoholics Anonymous and these for, for, for drug problems and alcohol problems. I didn't know you could, there was a whole community that would still use this philosophy to help somebody who'd gone into debt. And it was a whole psychology. I realized every time I would say, oh, I will go do this later, I was debting to myself. And I, I, I switched this psychology into one that worked. And I said, what made this work so well? I got in and out of debt so quickly by working with this community. So what makes that culture work? And these principles, the 12 steps of the program, actually correspond with these values. We admitted we're powerless over alcohol or debt that had become taken over our lives. The value of honesty came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, the value of hope, made a decision to turn our will over to God, faith, and as you can see, those values go down. These values are governing what has been the most successful recovery program of all time. And once I, I recovered, I said, what am I, what am I really going to do? in life now. I was done with the watch business, that was for sure. <laughs> and a friend from school 
Georgetown Coaching School approached me. He's the author of this book here, Tribal Leadership, which some of you have heard of. I think there might even be a class on it while we're here. Tribal Leadership. Dave Logan, the author, said, I, I wrote this book. I want you to market it. I said, great. I'd love to help out. And I did. I started getting it on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and got really got the book going, got some viral videos going. And one of the people I sent it to was I heard about this culture, because this book is all about culture and developing a strong culture. And I thought, okay, who can I get this to that would make a really big impact on that if, if, if we work with them, there could be a really big breakthrough here. And that was Tony Shea, CEO of Zappos. I sent him the book. Who, just so I know, who here has heard of Zappos before? You, great. So Zappos is known for being the biggest shoe store in the world. Started off by, by this guy here, Tony. Uh, actually, it was one of his investments that he made. He had made... $265 million selling his company to Microsoft and invested in a lot of companies and found Zappos was the one where people were really having fun and enjoying themselves. And that's the one he wanted to work at. So I sent it, the book to Tony and he loved it. He just thought it was, it was absolutely fabulous. And I knew that the culture of Zappos was just an incredible place to be. People are constantly having fun, enjoying themselves, joking around, and yet still being the number one shoe store, still driving a billion dollars worth of revenue. And people would wonder, how could that happen? And I think the best way to give you an impression of what life is like there is a little video that was put together for one of the big all-hands meetings to share with the, with the world what Zappos is, what it does, and what life is like there. This is all completely produced by people at Zappos, the music, the video, everything. And it, it, for people who've been there, they say it really does feel like this. So in the back, you could go with the video next.
Zappos. <laughs> so all that fun and people joking around, it constantly happens there, and yet American Express's own customers rank Zappos as number one in customer service. And that extended beyond shoes to all kinds of different product lines. And when I went and visited with the authors, I got this culture book. Every year, the company puts together what the, the employees think of the culture. And I opened this book up, and I read amazing stories. One where a woman said her sister had died, and she was so sad, but she was overwhelmed even more by the support of the company. Hundreds of people just giving her love and support every day. And that's why she was so proud to be part of the Zappos family. And I said, I've really got to go experience this in some way. I've got to be a part of this family. And so many people have come, thousands of visitors who've come to have a great time. Um, even a, a couple got married at Zappos. They're, they're not employees. They got married at Zappos. They were just so excited to be there. And so, of course, again, I thought, okay, what is it that makes this culture work? And you might be seeing a theme here, which is the Zappos family core values. These 10 principles that are running the company, even more than managers. Principles like deliver wow through service. Deliver wow. In fact, there's something people call uh, at Zappos the wow face, where you have two W's and you go, wow. <laughs> and embrace and drive change. Create fun and a little weirdness. Build open and honest relationships with communication. Pursue growth and learning. All these things that everybody learns in training. You hear stories about each of the values. They're on everybody's badge. They're all around the walls. Every evaluation is not done for performance. It's done for how well do you live the values. The values are running the entire company. And when people have to make decisions, they talk from the values, and the values help make the decisions, even more than management does. I knew, having been a manager there, that I would hear my own employees talk about the values in conversation to help them make decisions. And so Tony had asked, can the culture itself be a product? So many people were coming through asking about how to do this that they said, can we sell this? And that was when he brought in me to determine how to create a business model out of this. Because the first thing we did is he wanted it to be a video site. We would just send videos around the world telling people how to do this. So we created an event and brought people in and gave them all the information, how we do training, recruiting, customer service, everything, but then also gave them an experience of being on the phones, of going out and partying, of having dinners together. And then after the whole thing, asked them what would they thought. And they said the information was okay, the experience was amazing. They said the experience was amazing. That's what stuck with them. And if you think about that, think of any other conference that you've been to. How much do you remember the information, but how much do you remember what you experienced? Or in other words, what you were feeling. It's a feeling that it comes down to, and that's what culture is. When you walk into an organization, I can walk into an organization and within two minutes I will know their culture. Just by speaking with a few people, just by noticing the emotions that are there, just by how they say, hi, how are you, can I get you something? You can tell that. Rather than doing a whole evaluation, you know a culture within the first few minutes that you get there. It's a feeling. So the first hack I'm going to tell you before we even talk about hacking is how you walk into a room can shift an entire culture. How you walk into a room, what you say, how you say it can immediately shift a culture. There's so much going on, so much energy, that if you walk into a room and you are calm, collected, confident, peaceful, happy, that sets the tone for everybody interacting with you that day. It sets that tone immediately. Versus if you walk into a room and you're frazzled, you're stressed, you're annoyed, 
then people start thinking things. They think, why are they so annoyed? Maybe something's wrong. Maybe something as bad is happening. And it creates this culture of fear immediately just when you walk into a room. So this first hack is to pay attention to that. Rather than thinking about the whole culture and how you can change that, how you walk into a room is going to affect that. And this is the nature of how hacking works. So what does this mean to be a hacker? To be a hacker, think about a computer hacker, somebody who brings down a security system. What are they really doing? They're not using it for good, but what are they doing is they see a whole system, a network, various computers, connections, hubs, ports, but they see one spot where if they go in there and do something, it can affect the entire network just in one vulnerable spot. And you can use that for good. It happens immediately and it changes the whole system. That is what true hacking is. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. Some of these culture hacks are things that do not take months or years. They take a moment to do something that can impact the entire culture. That's how you become a culture hacker. Culture itself, as you know, is a system, just like a network, a computer network. It has various people. It has systems of bringing people in, training, service, execution, leadership. All of these things are tied together into a system. And at Zappos Insights, the program that we started, interest was growing, and it was growing very quickly. Our team was expanding. At first, it was just me. Then we had a whole production team, a whole startup company within Zappos. And it eventually expanded to 20 people. We had a whole website with all kinds of events, offerings, videos, a membership site. And we were having fun doing it. We were celebrating birthdays with our customers. This is the be uh, before a morning meeting starting with my team. Everybody just relaxing and having fun. And I'll tell you how we hacked our own scrum meeting. Um, in a, in a moment. This is me on my birthday and they pranked my desk by wrapping it in bubble wrap. And what they did was they knew I hate glitter. I, d I despise it. And they, at every layer they put glitter in there. And then so I had to eat, unwrap, every time I unwrapped it glitter goes everywhere. And then when I finally was done, had that, I sit down at my desk and they're all smiling and I don't know why. And they take a rocket and they shoot it above my head to a whole bag of glitter that just exploded all over me. Everybody laughing hysterically, right? These are the kind of things that would happen every day because we just knew how to have fun through it, even when we were stressed. Here's Mig with his own hack. I'm in the zone. Do not disturb until 12 p.m. unless it's for food. He didn't tell everybody to be quiet. He just put a note on his headphones. So there was all this fun, all this profit from living from the values. My team would constantly be talking about the values. They would hold me to it and say if I was not living the values. And then there was resistance from our customers, from our own customers, because they, wouldn't, they would want it so bad. They would come in and see that environment and love it and say, I want a company like that, but I can't have it. I can't have that. I can't have what you have. And they would cite every reason. They would say, we are too big. We're too small. The CEO stops us. It's HR. We don't have money. Name your excuse. They had it. But some people did do it. So what was the difference? Why could some people do it and some couldn't? Now I want you to stand up, everybody together, stand up. I'm going to sh we're going to start with our first culture change right here. So put your hands up. All right, stretch to one side. Uh huh. Stretch to another. Now it's going to get a little sillier. And now I just want you to shake like this. Uh huh. Yeah, bounce. Mm hmm. You guys look so funny. <laughs> All right. Okay. And now stop. All right, and just notice the feeling in your body. Notice how it feels just a little bit different. And this was just 
20 seconds of a shift, a shift in energy. Because think about it. Think about when you've walked in to work and you've had a lot of energy, right? It doesn't matter what you're doing. You can put that to it. And then imagine when you're going into work when you have no energy. Somebody could put your favorite project in front of you and you just wouldn't want to do it because you have no energy. And this, what we just did for a moment, took 20 seconds. But so much of us, we spend the time sitting down in front of our computer screens for hours without moving. But energy is a currency within culture. And you can take that time to use it. If you build that at Zappos, we would sometimes have three-minute dance parties. Just throw on a music, one song, everybody dancing up in the air, boom, three minutes are done, go back to work. Go ahead and sit down. That's how fast a shift in culture can happen. Just the smiles on your faces right now versus when you first stood up. Completely different culture in the room. It can be an instant shift to hack the culture. So again, we have to turn to this philosophy of what it means to be a hacker, especially when we were going in to help these companies. Because like I said, 25,000 people would come through a year just to watch Zappos work. And then we'd have hundreds of companies pay us thousands of dollars to ask, how do you do all these things? But some would go home and be successful and shift their culture and others would do nothing. Most would do nothing. And that bothered me. They had a great time while at the company. It wasn't like we were selling them something bad. They enjoyed themselves. They loved it but they weren't creating the culture change that they wanted. So that got me thinking, how, would, how, how can they change it? How can they change it quickly? Hack number two, I realized, is to destroy something. Destroy something. This is a master tool of hackers, and you can use it in a positive way. But first, I need you to understand what destroying means and how powerful it is. Think about it this way. How long does it take to build a building? What, a year, two years? Long time. Long time to build a building. How long does it take to destroy a building? Like that. So destruction is more powerful than creation in terms of hacking, in terms of creating an instant change. So the question now becomes, what is something that is not working that you can destroy? because that will have a faster, bigger impact. Oftentimes, what that thing is, is a person. It's a person who's bringing people down. It's a person who might be a great programmer, but they make everybody feel awful and terrible. And destroying that, getting that person out of there with honor and dignity, creates a whole uplift to the rest of the culture. What I've seen is companies sometimes go back and they say, you know what? We don't need to wear this clothing. You can wear whatever you want. You can wear jeans. And then they destroyed the dress rules. And all this energy came up in the company because they destroyed something they didn't need, destroyed something that doesn't work. If you can find that and eliminate that, you've started to hack the culture. Hack three, your company is not medication. Your company is not medication. The idea with this is that what leaders and managers will sometimes do is they want something from the company. I was talking to a leader who said, I need my team to be more excited. I need them to have all this energy. And I said, okay, let me ask you one thing first. When you go home after work and you're with your family, and you're doing what you do on the weekends, how much excitement and energy do you have? And she said, oh, none. It's awful. And I said, okay, we've got to fix that. Because right now, you're using your people to try to get excitement for yourself. And I said, first thing you're going to do is you're going to go home and name some exciting things you can do. And she did, and I said, I want you to do them. And she did them, and she created that excitement. And then she went back to the company and I checked in after a month. I said, how is things going in your culture? She said, it's going fantastically well because she got the energy that she wanted to bring to the culture. So if you want something at your company, whatever it is, passion, excitement, energy, 
anything. If you're not bringing it, then you're using the company as medicine for why your life isn't working. It's that real. Anything you want, you have to give and will become more of it. Hack four. Frustration is gold. This can be a hard one to realize because it can just be so hard in the moment. But what I've found is that anytime there's frustration, frustration means there's energy. It's just blocked. And it can happen for a variety of reasons. At Zappos, it happened when the companies that, uh, that were buying shoes from, some would ship out shoes to the customers and they'd be late. And we couldn't do anything about it. And so we had a decision to make. Are we going to commit to service or to working with these companies? And we committed to service and lost 25% of revenue and profit in one day. It was frustrating. But in the long run, became the biggest shoe store in the world. And those shoes, the companies shipped the shoes back to Zappos so that Zappos could ship it for them. So frustration means there's energy and frustration means there's an opportunity if you can see it. If you cannot get caught up in the emotion. So this idea that frustration is gold can trigger you in a moment. But I've always found that there's an opportunity in it. What you don't want is apathy, no energy, people not caring. If people don't care, you can't work with them. You might even have to get them out because there's no energy there. If they're frustrated, if they're angry, that means they care. That means they have passion, and you can shift it from one area to another. Hack five, use ritual for energy. Use ritual for energy. So this is where my team did our own version of adding to Scrum in the morning when we would get together. We're a non-technical team, but what we would do was I wanted to create energy every day. So rather than just focus on this is what I'm going to do today, I had them each start with sharing one thing that they were happy about or thankful for or excited about. It doesn't have to do with work even, anything in life, anything that you're happy about, thankful for or excited about. And they would one by one share. And in that meeting, everybody would get that energy and everybody would get that excitement. And we would do that every day. So we didn't wait for something good to happen to celebrate and say, great. You had to look every day for something to celebrate. And it would just take a minute every time. And people loved it. We all looked forward to it. 8.15 a.m. every day, you are in that area and you're sharing that thing that you're excited about that makes you thankful. So like we did here standing up or like that three-minute dance party I talked about, you'll forget about it. You easily will, unless you make it a ritual. We developed something called 3 p.m. Thursday Dance Party. 3 p.m. Thursday Dance Party, it would happen. It would just be 10 minutes, but it would be a dance party on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Create a ritual for your energy so that you don't forget it. And I advise doing it, one for a daily basis, another for a weekly. At Zappos, we have uh, uh, four times a year, the whole company gathers in a big theater, a thousand people to have videos and sketches and talking for five hours and a party. And the phones, nobody's answering the phones. 10,000 calls a day and nobody's there to answer the phones because it's that important to stop and say, how do we energize ourselves? So it's happening with teams on a monthly basis. With my team, it happened on a daily basis. Create these rituals for energy and you will hack your culture. So one of the things I did was I created a lot of these, these hacks and various theories into a blueprint. This is called the Culture Blueprint. And if, if any of this interests you, it's my gift to you. I'll, I'll give you a free digital copy. If you just want to email my email address there, robert at cultureblueprint.com, I will send you a download for free. Um, if these hacks are helpful for you, this is just the beginning of how this works. So I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Maybe if there's a mic here, if anybody has a pressing one that would help.
got a question back there? I can scream if you want. Go for it. Yes. <laughs> well, then you're going to have the biggest impact on your day. <laughs> One of the things uh, that, that you can hack your own productivity, you may have heard this, to hack yourself. What you can do is do one important thing before you touch your email. If you do that, that one thing that you, that, that you will do, it will create so much energy and then you'll go through your email very quickly. Try that. It's an amazing hack on yourself to do something, a task that has nothing to do with email. Before you do your email, it'll change your tone and energy for the day. Yes. Well, e because what happened was each of them start. Each of them was a question. Each was a what if we live this value. If you notice. Whether it be Debtors Anonymous or Zappos or Burning Man, the values weren't just words. They each had sentences with them because it wasn't just about a word. It was about living it, putting into action, asking a question. When values come alive, they just have a lot more words to them. So that was the consistent thing I realized about the cultures that had really, really strong cultures and values is that it went beyond a word into stories, into explanations, into questions, into conversation. Okay. Yes. Uh, a structure is uh, something that I get back with me when I come home. Where are the limits between my professional life and my private life? I've got the impression that uh, uh, when I sort of buy a kit, for instance, uh, it looked for me a bit as a set, as a brainwashing, everybody happy. Where is the place for dissidents? Uh, where is the place for counterculture in your culture? Yes, great question. So. There is, if, if you go through there, it looks like people who would not be friends with each other. People who dress very differently, act very differently, have different interests, but they all share the values. And Zappos has been uh, accused of being a cult, but it's actually very much the opposite of a cult. I'll give you an example of why this is the opposite of, of, a, of a brainwashing cult behavior. Because what most companies will do when they have an event or a happy hour, they say, okay, after work, come, we're going to get together and do this corporate thing. And what a cult does is takes you away from your friends and your family and says only focus on the company. But what Zappos would do, and this is just one example, is when we would have an event like that, it would happen at 4 p.m. during the work day so that it would end by 6 so that you can go home and have your life with your friends and your family. So it, it has that cult-like feeling of happiness, but if you look at the actual behaviors, it supports dissidents it supports your friends and family. It brings in friends and family and gives you time to spend with them. Does that make sense? I think we have maybe time for one more. It seemed to me that you confronted uh, information uh, against experience. And I feel like uh, getting information is anyway an experience. It can be. But... <laughs> Imagine I was up here delivering all this information with no photos and I was just talking like this the whole time. Just saying it this way for an hour. <laughs> I think the information lands a little differently. <laughs> it's a bad experience. <laughs> right. Right. So now I want you to notice how it, how it is now and just for a moment I want you to close your eyes. And just breathe. This will just be literally about a minute. So just close your eyes for a minute and breathe and focus on your chest. And imagine there's a light in your body. And as you breathe in, it powers that light. And that light expands. Each time you breathe in, expanding more. That light goes outside your body to the people next to you. And imagine that light within you starts to go around the room.
And each time you breathe, it powers that light. And when you breathe out, you let go of anything you do not need. And now slowly begin to open your eyes. And notice how you're feeling, what you're thinking, how there's a different energy in the room. And I leave you with this last bit, which is there's another culture, and that is Scrum. Another culture that's driven by values. And I think it's easy to get lost within the system of Scrum, of all the mechanics that have to be done. Now, I've known that people find it a challenge to get Scrum to really stick. And what my belief is, is that if you're too focused on the system, it's not going to work. But if you focus on those values, here's another that you might recognize, a certain manifesto that's also values, values written out in sentences here. So the scrum values, the agile manifesto values, all these, if you have that at the core, bring that every day into conversation and ask, how are you living it? Then you can look at a system like this as a culture hacker and hack it so that it works for you. Thank you very much. Great to see you.